coming this evening. Uh, uh, today is the, uh, the uh, first combined uh, meeting with Johns Hopkins. And uh, so we're very pleased to have a uh, number of people here from Hopkins. Many of them are, are regular uh, comers. Uh, but uh, we're Johns Hopkins is represented by uh, Professor Mark Luciano, who made it through the traffic this evening and runs the CSF Hydrodynamics uh, Center at uh, Johns Hopkins <coughs> and has been doing very formative work in the understanding of hydrocephalus. Uh, we have a lot of other guests this evening and I made a list of some of them. I'd like to welcome, of course, Claire Francomano from uh, Greater Baltimore and Johns Hopkins, Peter Rowe from Internal Medicine, Johns Hopkins, uh, who's had some profound, done some profound work on the understanding of uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome and these hypermobility connective tissue disorders. We're uh, very pleased to have Shabnan Dadgar here this evening, uh, who is a obstetrician gynecologist uh, by way of Philadelphia, New York, uh, um, uh, a, a two fellowships at George Washington. And she's done a lot of, and also uh, work at uh, Atlanta. She's done a lot of work on polycystic ovarian syndrome, and also has an interest in, in infectious diseases, and is interested in looking at the endocrinologic aspects and how they can affect uh, hypermobility disorders. Uh, along the same vein, David McDonald has uh, come down from Charlottesville, uh, Virginia this evening. Thank you, David. Uh, David, um, from what I understand from his patients, is a really extraordinary doctor who takes on the most complicated patients uh, from an integrative medical approach. And, uh, and we're also talking to him about looking at the endocrinology of what's going on and how we can use that to improve the lives of uh, EDS patients. Um, to Dr. Miles Kirby, who's done all the work in craniometrics, and uh, which has now been instituted in the very language that's used at NIH, where he did spent many years. So uh, NIH is now using the language that we use for all studies that pertain to the craniocervical junction. Uh, uh, we have Stacia Jones, down from New York, who's recently joined us, uh, who is a doctor of podiatry, uh, wound care, and also has a very uh, broad and integrative approach to medicine. So Stacy, nice to have you here. I'm proud to have a uh, new colleague, Robert Rosenbaum, uh, a neurosurgeon uh, who done a lot of work with the Wounded Warriors, uh, an inventor, uh, Neurosurgeon of the Year uh, per Medtronic, and uh, and he'll be starting with us uh, in just a few weeks. So it's great to have you, Robert. Uh, um, before I introduce uh, two speakers, I'd like to also uh, introduce Dr. Bundu, who is an anesthesiologist now working with Kaiser, uh, and. We had a bit of turnover here recently, but on the weekend that she left, we had a very difficult patient that, that no anesthesiologist or ENT surgeon would, would tackle because she had such a difficult airway. And um, she had an unusual appliance in the airway that made it extremely difficult to cannulate the trachea in order to perform the surgery. And so we had, we had to perform the surgery we had no anesthesiologist willing to tackle this. And uh, uh, she had been to Hopkins and had gotten some good work done there, but they were kind of, you know, leaning back a little bit. But uh, Kadia stepped forward and investigated how to do this, learned the very intricate technique of an endoscopic uh, uh, intubation uh, through an existing small T-tube, I won't go into the details, and carried out this anesthesia uh, on her very last day 
when you know most people were <laughs> you know, uh, she came in and did this really <coughs> difficult case one of the most challenging patients I've ever had so um, in a in a country I'm afraid to say where standards don't seem to be going up you know we have a few stars like Kadia Bandhu who is who really puts herself out there on the line and gives superb care and so I'd like to give you a, I have a gift, gift card for you. Oh, and the, thank you. The trip to Venice, uh, Paris. <laughs> and the, the QE2 on the way back. Uh, I didn't mention uh, Claudia Austin, uh, a brilliant internist who's also taken a strong interest in dystonia and is not afraid to take on our most difficult patients. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, invite um, Sarah Merritt to come up. Uh, Sarah trained at, uh, in Alabama and then Chapel Hill and fellowship at Johns Hopkins. Uh, she's a wonderful, compassionate and brilliant doctor, has a pain practice just down the road in Bowie. She's a uh, chairperson of the Legislative Council for the state uh, medical society and also one of the experts in the drug monitoring program for the state of Maryland and so is in a great position to talk about opioid prescribing guidelines. So Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, Dr. Henderson, Brendel, thank you. That's um, an awesome story to share and uh, it means a lot. Um, I've found um, that caring for patients with Ehlers-Danlos has been um, very gratifying. Um, they have some different issues than some of my other patients. Um, some of them take opioids, some of them don't. I would say actually it's probably a, a minority of my EDS patients that are, that are taking a daily opioid um, because there are so many other things that can work for the various um, problems that go with this um, with this particular disease. So um, I would position myself as uh, the person who can tell you about opioid prescribing in general and I um, when I think about this talk and what I want to share with you really the um, the goal here is maybe to make sure that the providers in the audience sort of understand you know what are the CDC guidelines and why did these come about uh, and for the patients in the audience, if your conversations with your providers have changed or if the timber of uh, the way they relate to you has changed related to opioid prescribing, maybe we can all uh, understand this a little better. Um, and I hope to leave a little time for questions and answers also. Um, when Dr. Henderson had asked if I would speak to this group, um, I thought this would be a good topic. But uh, again, the other um, material that I wanted to share is going to be presented by Dr. Verdun um, because he is an expert in ketamine infusion uh, for pain management. Uh, he's at Walter Reed. Um, Dr. Henderson will introduce him later, but I just wanted to kind of describe to you um, how it is that we're presenting together. Um, and I think that the, there's a lot of potential um, for ketamine and its relatives um, to treat various types of pain. Okay. So this is my practice. Um, I have an office in um, Bowie. I see patients on an outpatient basis there and um, I'm glad you know, we are taking new patients and I'm glad to see consults from, from many of you. Um, and then here's I have to read my cartoons because sometimes people will say they, they can't read them. So then I feel like it makes it less funny, right? It's not funny if I read it. But um, the doctor's talking to the patient and he says, have you tried enjoying the aches and pains? That, you know, that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we're doing here. Um, but really, like, why did I go into pain management? Uh, I've really found that if you help somebody with significant pain, you may have helped them with their worst problem. And uh, when I trained uh, in the OR in anesthesiology, uh, there were aspects of that that I really enjoyed, but, but I actually really missed the continuity with patients. Um, and I missed, you know, those longitudinal relationships and, and helping people uh, over time. And so that's what I enjoy about my, my practice. Have a disclosure slide. I, I'm not 
currently speaking for any uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, so I would say that that does not have no biases uh, with regard to any particular medications. Um, but I would say that I'm a clinician and I treat patients. I'm not just a, a researcher or uh, <coughs> any other kind of doctor. Um, so as a person who treats patients and as an opioid prescriber, uh, I think that does maybe bias my presentation is worth, worth saying. Um, so I want to discuss um, the opioid crisis in the background just a little bit, um, the need for and the utility of guidelines. And then there are 12, um, 12 guidelines put out by the CT CDC, kind of run through those and um, explain maybe what they are. I also have um, a slide or so about the Maryland Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. I know with the webcast, this may be available to people in all states, and every state is going to be different with regard to the, the legislation um, surrounding um, prescription drug monitoring. Um, doctors are uh, licensed and regulated on a state level. Um, there are similarly uh, <coughs> prescription drug monitoring programs are regulated on a, on a state level also. And so that's why uh, with, with the absence of a federal regulation to change that, uh, we will have a fragmented system of different state uh, databases for the foreseeable future. Um, so in general, the numbers described are at least 11% of Americans experience chronic or daily pain. Um, opioids are frequently prescribed uh, to treat this. Of course, um, if you're someone like Brendel and you're in bed and in a lot of pain and, you know, an opioid really wasn't going to fix that problem, right? You know, if it's, so if we've, if we've got a fixable problem, you know, we need to get some treatment for that. Opioids might be part of that treatment. Opioids might help you um, advance or do better. Um, but they're frequently prescribed for chronic pain, whether it's something that's uh, in the midst of being uh, treated and, and solved, like a surgical problem, uh, and others that are ongoing prescriptions, sometimes for months or years. Um, the CDC opioid prescribing guidelines actually are directed to primary care providers, and um, that's because um, if you were to break down and look at all the opioid pain medications dispensed, and there's a big study on this recently that came out from CMS or Medicare data, that 50% uh, of the total opioids dispensed in this country come from primary care providers. And so because this is a very large segment of the population that presumably is mostly treating um, chronic pain and maybe some acute pain, uh, those practices uh, are being addressed. Uh, and a lot of them, when you survey them and you ask them how they feel, a lot of them report concerns about insufficient training with regard to uh, opioid prescribing. Um, so I have a slide just to convey a little of the severity of the opioid ap epidemic. These are um, total numbers of deaths by substance in Maryland. And as you can see, prescription opioid deaths um, are sort of flat, meaning that there's a certain number of people who uh, unintentionally may take too much medication um, and overdose. Um, and so the prescription opioid number there is flat. Heroin and fentanyl, however, are really uh, increasing and continue to go up. This data ends in 2015, but really um, fentanyl in particular, uh, if you keep up with the lay press um, articles on opioids, is a very um, popular um, medication uh, out there to be abused. Um, and I guess I should back up a step and, you know, why are we talking about street drugs more, you know, when this is geared toward patients and prescribers. But, um, you know, the, the reality is that um, there are patients who will get exposed to an opioid from a legitimate prescription for a doctor and may end up um, using street opioids. The other reason that it's worth talking about is because the CDC guidelines really were not developed to improve pain care. They were developed to address the opioid death epidemic, as they will call it. So it's really not about caring for people's pain better. It's really not about you know taking better care of patients. The, the guidelines are really about um, how can we prescribe in such a way that's judicious and is going to hopefully not feed into the opioid epidemic as it is. Um, and I would say also, these are data from Maryland, but um, other states look very similar. If you're really interested in um, 
some of the information about the opioid epidemic itself. This is a really neat book. It's called Dreamland. It's by um, Sam Kenyon. Uh, he won a book circle, National Critics Book Circle Award. Um, it's also available on Audible uh, if you like to listen while you're driving. Um, he uh, really kind of breaks down um, prescription opioids uh, and the changes in prescribing that have happened with physicians and then also uh, the some changes in the illicit drug market and how really those two things were separate but ultimately acted together to make the opioid epidemic where it is. Um, and so this is the elephant and he's at the psychiatrist and he says, I'm right there in the room and no one even notices me. So he's the elephant in the room. So the elephant in the room is that opioids alone just by themselves are probably not the best treatment for chronic pain. That maybe opioids in conjunction with other things, opioids in conjunction with um, therapy or anti-neuropathic pain medica medications or, you know, kind of in more of a comprehensive or even, um, even multimodal plan of care uh, is probably a more effective way to treat pain. Um, so that's the environment in which the CDC guidelines um, emerged. And basically, the, the CDC sort of felt a need to do this um, because down further on the page here, previous guidelines were um, not entirely consistent with one another. There were guidelines from the Department of the Defense, Depart from Washington State. Um, the most recent national guidelines um, didn't incorporate evidence that implicated higher doses in more um, overdose deaths for those patients who were just legitimately taking prescribed opioids but still had an overdose event. Um, and so I just feel like I need to touch on what what does this word evidence-based medicine mean? Um, so as physicians we are uh, advised or compelled to con consider practicing evidence-based medicine and this is a a quote from this BMJ article that's been cited like 12,000 times. Um, and so the use of a guideline, uh, which is what the CDC guideline is, uh, to support a decision is, is using evidence-based medicine. Now, this is not like a protocol or a cookbook where all patients are treated the same. Um, you know, it'd be great to have some you know, a, a study about each each population that's out there, but we just don't have that, right? Do we have specific information about opioids in the EDS population or in uh, QRI malformation? We don't have specific studies on that, and so we really just have to use the data we have and apply our brains and, and make our best assumptions about what's appropriate. Um, and so um, guidelines are based on evidence. We, try, we um, are to use them uh, to make good decisions, but they're not necessarily to be slavishly uh, adhered to either. And so there are 12 guidelines. Uh, we'll go through them sort of one by one. And so this is the, the porcupine and the dog. And the, the uh, dog says to the porcupine, on the plus side, you've cured my back pain. <laughs> and so this is recommendation number one, that non-pharmacologic therapy and non-opioid pharmacologic therapy are preferred for chronic pain. Now, just to poke a little bit of a hole in this in this guideline, you would say this sounds very reasonable, but actually there's not comparator trials, there are not randomized controlled trials to really say that these things are better. It's just that maybe they're a little less risky, and so that's why um, why the recommendation is described this way. Um, and I would say, you know, most most doctors and most patients start there. Um, there should be a consideration of risks and benefits. Um, and again, to combine them, and I, I'm a believer in this, combining them with either non-opioid pharmacologic therapies and other non-pharmacologic therapies where it's appropriate for the patient. Um, recommendation number two, before starting uh, with opioid therapy for chronic pain, clinicians should establish treatment goals, including realistic goals for pain and function, uh, including uh, consideration about discontinuation. So. Um, Goals for pain and function, I think, are really helpful. If um, you know, I when I'm talking to a patient about their opioid, and it's pretty clear, you know, oh, doc, you know, I could, I can do so much more with this 
prescription, you know, if I have my medication, I can do X and Y and Z on a good day. Um, that's very helpful information. And so it's something that um, most of us who are prescribing should consider documenting, you know, what are those functional changes and, and set these goals and make sure that, that the patient is achieving them. Um, and this, um, this does make some sense, but I, I think um, This does make some sense, but I think it's also important to realize that there are certain patients and certain conditions, right, that people may have for a lifetime, such as uh, patients with failed surgeries, patients with uh, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. You know, there are times that, um, you know, the goals of functioning may, the bar may be low. Um, recommendation number three, before starting uh, and periodically during opioid therapy, um, Clinicians should discuss the risks and the benefits and um, responsibilities for managing. So this is sort of covered usually in the opioid agreement that a patient might have with their provider, um, discussing you know that, that patients are aware, hopefully, that hey, there, there are risks. Um, the benefits are usually fairly apparent, um, but to make sure that the, those risks are discussed and that everyone knows um, their responsibilities for, for management. Recommendation number four is when starting opioid therapy for chronic pain, um, clinicians should prescribe immediate release instead of extended release or long acting opioids. Um, you know, when Oxycontin came out in 1996, the idea was, hey, it's less addictive because it's long acting, you're not gonna get a buzz off of it. Um, you take the medication and it's gonna stay in your system a long time. It's a good medication and I absolutely prescribe it. Um, however, I don't think there's great data that it's actually less addictive. This was you know, something that was, that was told to us. We don't think it's really less addictive and, and what we found out through subsequent years uh, is that probably a lot of the problems with opioids are more associated with really high doses and more you know, moderate, low dose uses can be sustainable for many patients. So a starting place would be just an immediate acting opioid. Methadone probably is, is not a first line choice. Um, and also that patients should get education about transdermal fentanyl because it's, um, it's very different than other medications. And this, uh, this doctor says to the patient, look, you've got to stop thinking that one little pill is going to solve all of your problems. You need to take at least four twice a day. So recommendation number five, when opioids are started, clinicians should prescribe the lowest effective dose. Use caution in any dosage, carefully reassess over 50 MME per day and avoid increases to greater than 90 uh, MME per day or carefully justify a decision to justify greater than 90. So this is like a potentially hot topic. Um, for if I was a primary care doctor, I would probably do this. Um, I read a commentary with one of the researchers, um, Roger Cho, that helped um, develop this guideline, uh, and he made some nice points that it's not like you're um, safe at 89 and unsafe at 91 milligrams of morphine. There's like sort of a continuum, and it's going to be different for every patient. Uh, and I didn't explain um, what a milligram morphine equivalent is, um, but for, for the lay people in the audience, um, that's like a like the common denominator. So morphine, you know, comes in some number number of milligrams. For instance, a 15 milligram tablet. Oxycodone um, has there's a certain number of milligrams of any other molecule that's equivalent for oxycodone, fentanyl, and you can do this math and like the the common factor that you convert everything into is milligrams of morphine. So these are just some dosing guidelines as far as what's too high or what's too much, um, and that. Um, I think the challenge with this recommendation is what do we do with these patients that, you know, that are already taking, you know, a good bit more than 90 milligrams of morphine per day. Um, in my practice, we, um, we talk to people about the risks and we try to um, decrease. Um, our goal, you know, our goal in the practice is probably to have most patients at 200 milligram morphine equivalent or lower. Um, but it's, it's really something that may take a lot of time. And um, with willing patients, and, and um, we try to find ways to um, 
to find a more optimal therapy. Uh, and in, in my experience, you know, with helping patients with dose reductions, if they're on high levels of several hundred milligrams of morphine per day, um, you know, we've really had some successes in reducing dose without, uh, without losing uh, function. Uh, and I think we've done that by going very slowly, letting it be sort of a patient-led um, process um, that we are guiding, um, but that the patient really is um, has some readiness to make the changes that um, that we've suggested, um, and uh, working sort of collaboratively, I would say. Uh, and I already talked about this. If the patient's already is receiving a high dose. Um, give them an option to reevaluate their therapy and um, work on a tapering plan if, if the patient is agreeable. Um, recommendation six is some recommendation about a treatment of acute pain. Um, some pretty specific suggestions here um, that three days is often sufficient. Uh, more than seven days will rarely be needed. Um, I saw an article in the New York Times um, just this week about uh, a lot of dentists trying to move away from prescribing really any opioids post-op uh, after a wisdom tooth extraction. And I think um, if that's doable in, in your practice as an oral surgeon, that's a great, that's a great idea. Um, fewer exposures, you know, presumably is going to lead to um, fewer patients who have um, illicit use in the long term. Um, and, and again, not even talking about chronic opioids for pain, but, but really patients who, you know, become addicted and end up on a path of using illicit opioids. Um, and the patient says, give it to me straight, doc. How long do I have to ignore your advice? And so that's the preface for the reassessment. So if you prescribe an opioid for pain and presumably for chronic pain, you should probably reassess them within one to four weeks rather than, oh, here's 90 days, see you then. Um, if, you're, if you're making a change, if you're instituting an opioid therapy, uh, you should reassess within one to four weeks, and um, if the benefits do not outweigh the harms, then you should reconsider what you're doing and reevaluate the ratio of benefits to harms every three months or so. Um, suggestions for tapering. Um, they do have some some uh, suggestions for times to su to consider tapering, and that includes um, higher opioid doses greater than 50 mme, which I, I think I would say that's high. I'd say that's just m maybe moderate, um, without evidence of, of benefit. So if if a patient's really like, Doc, I don't know if this is working or not. Okay, well, let's try tapering it, and then we're going to know because either either you're going to be like, Yeah, that was not helping at all, and you're not going to miss it, or um, you're going to find that uh, that it was making a difference or it is making a difference in your function and then we can better assess and guide your treatment. Um, recommendation eight, before starting and periodically during therapy, evaluate various risk factors for harm and use strategies to mitigate risk. So, so um, risk factors for harms include things like uh, obstructive sleep apnea, that's a cofactor for over sedation related to opioids. Uh, history of substance abuse is a history, is, excuse me, is a risk factor for opioid overuse. So there's a, you know, a litany of, of these risk factors and they should be, should be considered. And if a patient has a high, high risk, um, the prescriber should consider offering naloxone. And this is even in primary care that this is being suggested. I like this one. The, um, I guess this is the doctor that comes to the bedside. I don't know who she is. She says, I hope these make you feel better because they're all you're getting. She has flowers for him. Um, so then recommendation number nine, this clinicians should review the state prescription drug monitoring program is what PDMP is short for, um, to assess for what else the patient is taking. Um, And I, I really think this is important uh, down at the bottom, again, um, regarding, uh, you know, say a patient who wasn't being honest with you or um, a patient who does seem to have developed a problem. Um, you know, in my training at one point, you know, it would be advised like, well, you know, if the patient's um, 
appears to be misusing their medication, you know, then you can just write them a taper and you discharge them. Um, well, that's really not a great treatment for substance use disorder, which, you know, presumably somebody has if they're not using their medications appropriately. And, and so really a, a, a better treatment is to um, provide information and interventions. And in my practice, we actually have started prescribing um, Suboxone for opioid use disorder uh, and can use that either to taper patients, to refer them to a rehab center. Um, and it's, it's been um, very helpful, I think, to have that tool and that extra training uh, in, in my practice. Um, just briefly, the Maryland Prescription Drug Monitoring Program um, has been around for about four years now. Um, so the PDMP is the department from the state. CRISP is the health information exchange for our region. Um, there is um, ability for law enforcement to search the PDMP. Uh, and, and my the committee that I'm on with that with the PDMP, we've we've uh, had an opportunity to review. You know what is law enforcement doing with it, and it's been very interesting. Um, and. Uh, but the data is really, uh, other than um, by, by directly by subpoena, um, it's really only for doctors to search their own patients. You're not to search um, patients you're not treating, um, but it provides useful information to show a doctor, um, say, concurrent prescriptions for um, sedative and hypnotic drugs like to help with sleep or uh, benzodiazepines. So if you're considering prescribing an opioid for a patient, you're gonna know um, what other controlled substances they're on by using this database. Uh, and, and would of course show you if there were if someone was at higher risk, um, you would also possibly be able to assess that based on that that data. If, um, urine drug screens are recommended before starting and at least once a year. Um, so that there's a lot of uncertainty around what's the right amount to screen patients who are taking an opioid on an ongoing basis. I would say it's not uncommon to have um, patients screened quarterly, three or four times a year. Um, but there's not a firm uh, guideline other than at least annually. Um, and here's the doctor speaking with his patient. He's got his <coughs> boxers on and his cigarette lit. And the doctor said, you should relax less. Um, and I guess I, I have that right before the slide about benzodiazepines. Now in the, in the EDS, Chiari, patient world, uh, most of the patients that I have who take a benzodiazepine take Valium for spasticity rather than, say, for anxiety. So um, more commonly, people who are prescribed benzodiazepines take them for anxiety. Um, and so that's really more what this guideline is, is kind of about, is like find some other better evidence-based treatments for anxiety if possible, um, or see if the patient can convert to a as needed benzodiazepine rather than an, a daily benzodiazepine to reduce that risk that a patient is going to have of over sedation related to concurrent benzodiazepine and opioid therapy. Um, now, does that, does that mean that people can't take a benzodiazepine and an opioid together? No, but I think it just needs to be done judiciously and again with that documentation of you know what's appropriate and why and why it's being prescribed. Um, and again, sometimes a trial of weaning and just to see if it can be decreased is also um, helpful to understand uh, if that's even possible. Uh, and finally, uh, number 12 here is uh, clinicians should offer or arrange evidence-based treatment for patients with opioid use disorder. So we sort of touched on that with the weaning slide, um, but that um, for patients, patients who do have opioid use disorder and there's a DSM-5 criteria um, that have to do with um, overusing opioids and using opioids in hazardous situations, neglecting responsibilities for medication. Those are the type of things that, that can push someone from take, you know, in terms of diagnostic criteria, uh, from being a person who's taking their medication in a compliant way to someone who's exhibiting some signs of substance use disorder. Uh, and so if you see that, then um, evidence-based treatment is medication assistant, assisted treatment or MAT with buprenorphine uh, or even methadone. Um, and, and abstinence from opioids, um, if somebody has opioid use disorder, it's certainly reasonable to advise, hey, that's a great idea, just stop. Um, but that's not actually supported in the medical literature as uh, best practice for um, 
is, is the best, best advice for treating that problem. Um, and so the doctor speaking with the patient, he says, I can cure your back problem, but there's a risk that you'll be left with nothing left to talk about. And um, that's really it. I want to just kind of summarize the guidelines and maybe leave some room for, for questions and things if uh, people are interested in some discussion and then also um, some time for Dr. Verdun to speak. Yes. Sarah, the, one of the, um, a couple of the unintended consequences of these guidelines that I've seen, one is that the patients who are on the high doses were not grandfathered in. So now their insurance companies are asking for prior authorization yes. for anything above 90 milligrams, <coughs> or they're refusing to pay. So one young woman with terrible neurosurgical mm -hmm. complications who's on a pretty high dose is mm -hmm. paying now three quarters uh, more, or th for three quarters, 300 percent more for her uh, morphine. Wow, uh, that's a shame. And that doesn't seem to have been the intent of the CDC guideline if it was to help the primary care practitioner with the average patient and not the complicated right. chronic pain patient. But that's what's happening out there, and they're increasing the number of paperwork burdens on physicians, which yes. I think will ultimately lead to discouraging doctors from wanting to take care of them. Absolutely. So yeah. there are some really bad unintended consequences of this effort. I agree. I agree. Yeah. We, um, we do these prior authorizations and we see it and um, at this point in terms of just getting something approved um, we can do it uh, a prior authorization I did today on a patient who takes methadone um, six tablets a day and by the way I've weaned her from being on 12 a day to six you know and she's doing awesome um, you know, and I'm doing this prior authorization, and pretty much all I had to say was she's been on this, and the, and they did approve it almost right away. But um, but it really required you know the physician to get on the phone, um, which is uh, costly, really. Um, but I don't think there's any concern from anyone other than us for you know as the the physicians for that. Yeah. Have you had any experience with low dose naltrexone with EDS, and if so, what has it been? I haven't, and I. Um, I sort of have on my uh, to-do list, bucket list, that I need to go to the LDN conference and, uh, and get familiar because I, I'm not familiar, I'm not a prescriber. Um, my, uh, my office nurse, her husband, takes LDN for Crohn's. So I do have someone who's you know, sort of close to me who, in my circle who, who uses it and has felt like it's been helpful in terms of the immunomodulatory effects of that for Crohn's disease. So, uh, and for anybody that doesn't know, but lotus naltrexone um, modulates the opioid system and presumably some of the immune system um, when it's taken in, in these small compounded doses. Yeah, do you have a question? Yes. Um, I know you mentioned that a population of your patients are EDS, and mm -hmm. certainly they're different from the norm. Yeah. Um, have you ever experienced times where they require much higher doses of painkillers to touch their symptoms, but they don't even get effects at all? Has that kind of posed up? So, you know, and I guess, uh, so I'm an anesthesiologist, and I've practiced in the OR, and I've, I've done that kind of work, you know, where you need to really anesthetize someone to the point of general anesthesia, and I've I've seen some of that, um, you know, so in my outpatient practice, it's a little different, you know, um, but yes, I do have some patients who I would say take maybe some higher doses than I would expect, um, but I think that's kind of the minority. Um, there are um, those patients, but I don't think, um, you know, if, if I was going to blanketly characterize my EDS patients, I would say, you know, again, there's a solid number of them that just don't take an opioid. Um, solid number of those people that take a benzo, um, and then there's this number of people that take um, take an opioid, and, and there's just a handful that take higher doses. Really, that's that's been my experience. Thank you. Hmm? Oh. Hmm. Yeah. So this is a pretty restrictive number. I mean, if you on fentanyl 50 batch, you're already out of this range. Right. You cannot get anything PRN on top of that. Right. Batch. Yeah. So. You know, looking at my patients and hearing to what they say, I had the impression that they go to pain medication doctor to get more and more. Mm -hmm. And they come to you guys and you guys want to wean them off? I think they were very disappointed. Uh, yeah. They, I think, um, yeah. The internet forums are full of um, 
advice how to get my doctor to increase my dose. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. They're also full of people who are in an absolute panic over the possibility of their painkillers disappearing, especially now that the FDA has recommended, was it Opana or mm -hmm. something, be discontinued. Right. Mm -hmm. There is people who are literally bed bound with right. panic at this point. I wonder what the CDC does about the methadone clinics that their patients of 20 years that go higher and higher and higher every year instead of going lower. Mm -hmm. That's challenging, yeah. How do they apply it on themselves, so to speak? I don't think it, yeah, I don't think it relates to that population at all. That's a very challenging thing to get off of 120 milligrams of methadone is, is really going to take a long time um, to get off of that in any kind of comfortable way. Um, and as kind of a side note, um, those methadone doses that people get from maybe a methadone clinic are not reportable to that prescription drug monitoring program. So I could be treating someone for methadone with chronic pain um, and they could be going to the methadone clinic and I, I mean really, there's like federally, I, there's no way I could know. It's, it's in the federal legislation that it's um, not reportable. So um, it's a problem. I, I think it's a problem. So for lay people that watch this video, um, if you on uh, Percocet 10 slash 325, right. uh, four times a day every six hours. 60 morphine equivalents. That's 60 morphine equivalents, right? Yeah, wow. 1.5 times milligrams of oxycodone. Yeah, so that's 60. Um, and I would say that's probably a real reasonable dose. Right. Um, but uh, according to these guidelines, um, primary care doctors may need to question that. And, and, and we're finding a lot of um, patients on doses like that who get referred, you know, to pain management just to maintain the medication because we can do it in a compliant way because we're accustomed to checking this database every but every visit because we're accustomed to, um, you know, taking the urine samples and things. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, uh, to be honest, you know, those are sometimes nice consults because they're maybe less challenging. They might have a regimen that works for them, um, but they, uh, yeah, it's 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 a con it's inconvenient for them potentially, you know, to, to need to transition to, a, to specialty pain practice for a, what's probably a moderate dose of, of opioid medication. All right, thank you.